Thank you all so much for joining us this evening. So glad to see that some of you came out in the rain. Uh, and we also have some residents joining us via Zoom. So we have a full house in person and virtually. <laughs> so I am Letitia Johnson, the District 4 City Council representative. And I am ecstatic to have our guest presenter here today. Um, I had the opportunity to work alongside of Lieutenant Terrell and uh, Fire Chief James Harris uh, a couple months ago, maybe, if even that long ago. Um, but unfortunately, we had just experienced a fire in the district and we lost two of our residents. And subsequent to that, I joined the fire department uh, and going out and passing out carbon monoxide detectors and smoke detectors because we were very intent on making sure that residents had access um, to smoke detectors, to carbon monoxide detectors to help them get out of a burning house. Um, and within that, I've always wanted to provide information to residents and even to myself. So I'll be sitting down taking notes as well uh, just to make sure that we Think about creating an emergency plan, creating an emergency kit so that if the time ever came for any of us to respond in an emergency, that we actually know what to do and not be panicked in the moment and trying to pull things together and trying to figure out what we do. And so it is my pleasure to introduce Lieutenant Terrell, who's with the Detroit Fire Department. Good evening, good evening. Thank you, Councilwoman Johnson. I appreciate you guys, and I appreciate you and your team. What she spoke to uh, a minute ago, just to let you guys know something. Councilwoman Johnson and her team has been really, really vital when it comes to us helping with making sure that the neighborhood and the community is safe. She's going light on what she did, but we've met and worked together a few times and her concern when it comes to the fire department and the community is astounding. On behalf of some of the guys at the firehouse who told me to speak on them, speak on their behalf from the last time you visited, they wanted to show their appreciation and say thank you. When I say she mentioned us going out, putting up smoke detectors and carbon monoxide detectors, she went house to house to house to house to house. Every house we did, she was right there with us, with that rig. And we appreciate you and your team for that. Thank you, guys. Thank you. Thank you very much. OK, so I'm going to do this presentation. And my presentations go a little bit like this. I'm going to make a deal with you guys, OK? I'm going to try to be as succinct as possible. And I'm going to try to keep it as, as light as I can. And I'll make a promise on behalf of my fiance that I will not use any analogies because she says they're horrible. So I won't do that. OK. <laughs> All right. And if you guys have any questions, once I'm done, I will try my best to answer them correctly. OK. If I don't have the answer, I will give you my email address. You can send it to me and I will direct you to whom or I will get you the answer myself. OK. Now, all I ask you to do is participate and pass the word. Anything that you pick up from here this evening, please don't be, don't be afraid to share it with your family, your friends, your neighbors, your church, uh, family, everyone around, okay? Deal? Yeah. Deal? Okay, all right, good. Uh, everybody at home, I want to say hi and welcome, and thank you guys for uh, joining us. I'm going to start off by saying, giving you guys a little bit of background on myself. I joined the fire department in 2000. In about three weeks, it'll be 22 years. I have been in the city fighting fires. This is a different aspect of the job, getting out in the communities, talking to different groups, as well as schools, and doing a lot of things in the community, which makes me feel great within and it really, really, really helps my brothers and sisters who are out in the fire houses when they respond. The safer you guys are, the safer they can be, okay? I 
done this for quite a bit and I am very, very knowledgeable when it comes to emergencies. I am an EMT, hazmat technician, confined space rescue, trench rescue, airport fire, aircraft firefighting, a lot of different aspects from high angle, I've repelled down buildings downtown. I want you guys to understand, I'm knowledgeable. I'm knowledgeable. I am not all knowing. Okay. <laughs> okay. Okay. We're going to start off in the home. When we talk about preparedness, what we're talking about is simply being ready. You guys did this every day. You guys do this every day. You guys did that preparing to come for here with grabbing your coats and your, your umbrellas just in case. You don't know. You know what the weather said, but you don't know what it's going to be in the moment that you're out in it. So you prepare for that. In your homes, we want you to be prepared as well. We're going to go over the list of items that was given out by Councilwoman Johnson and her team of some of those things, and I have some things that I'll probably add to it, okay? So let's start in the home. First and foremost, smoke detectors. Smoke detectors. We want them to work, and we want them to be viable in your homes, okay? We wanna make sure that you have at least two, two or more smoke detectors in your home and that you test them periodically. If you don't know, in the city of Detroit, if you live in a home, not a condo or an apartment, but if you have a home in the city of Detroit, you are allotted two smoke detectors and one carbon monoxide detector. That is no cost to you. That is no cost to the taxpayers. That is no cost out of the fire department's budget. All you do is contact us and we can either bring them to you or you can come down to Detroit Public Safety Headquarters and pick them up. We have some information here, the information pamphlet that's on the table. And for you guys at home, the information is, the phone number is 313-596-2959, 313-596-2959. And the email is communityrelations at DetroitMI.gov. That's community relations at DetroitMI.gov. Please, please, please pass the word. Pass the word to your church family, to everyone in, in your neighborhood, okay? We want everybody to be safe and with keeping with the commissioner's dream of us and our plan to get every home in the city of Detroit with viable smoke detectors and carbon monoxide detectors in the next five years, we are really on that path. And when I speak to what we did in the community with Councilwoman Johnson, that helps every number counts. What we have here is a smoke detector that we give you, okay, that you can get. You know, every year we say spring forward, fall back. Spring forward, fall back, what do you do? Change the batteries in your smoke detector, correct? Change the batteries with smoke. Can't get any batteries out of this. It's a lithium battery. This is 10-year smoke detector. Once you put this up, spring forward, fall back every year, change the clock. But, and you shouldn't have to do that nowadays. You don't have to worry about this. 10 years. Once you put it up, you're good. So we talk about the smoke detectors. What do we do when there is an issue? One, we place them in vital places. Smoke detectors, you don't want to place them outside right in the kitchen. I'm sure we've all experienced that when it's really close, it's going to go off all the time. We don't want that to happen. You want to place it just outside of the kitchen, okay? Or far away from the stove. You also want to place it in the hallway, in between the bedrooms, not near the bathroom. Same issue. If you're like me and you take hot baths and hot showers, the steam can set them off. So not right there by the bathroom door. You can place them in the bedroom as well. We take one and we place it also down the stairs towards the basement. You know that slant right there at the top? A lot of people smack the top of it when they go down the stairs, right? Right at the bottom, a couple steps before you get downstairs into the basement, take the smoke detector, pop it right there. If there's smoke coming from the basement, as soon as it hits that corner, it hits this, and it'll set it off, okay? The importance of this is that you guys are alerted if there's an emergency, immediately, as soon as possible. So if there is an emergency, what do you guys do? What do you do? The main focus is 
get out. Get out. Get out. Get out. Okay? That smoke detector is telling you to leave this place right now. It's not telling you to grab your cell phone. It's not telling you to grab your coat. It's not telling you to grab any your laptop. It's not telling you to put out the fire. Okay? It's telling you to get out. Who puts out the fire? We do. We do. We do. We'll handle it when we get there, okay? Um, with these smoke detectors, I want you guys to understand something. In your home, many of you have multi-floor dwellings, correct? Fire escape plan. That is vital. You've got to have a plan, okay? So, we've all been through schools and we've all experienced fire drills, correct? Everybody's experienced a fire drill. I think, I don't care what school you went to, what state you live in, one, a few things are cemented in fire drills. You get up together, you leave out calmly and quietly, correct? You follow your teacher or your instructor, right? Out of the nearest exit, and where do you go? You go outside, but your class goes to one specific area, right? Your class is not going to be with her class. Her class is not going to be with her class, correct? That is because we all want to be accountable for one another, correct? So when I talk to the kids in the schools, I give them the duty of going home, talking to their moms and dads and their brothers and sisters about creating essentially a fire drill at home. So when you test the smoke detectors, we want to make sure you guys got an escape plan. That way you all can get out. You all can know exactly where everybody's going to be, and you guys can meet and be accountable for each other. Because once we arrive as firefighters, once my brothers and sisters arrive, we would like to know that everybody is out safely, okay? We don't want John to go to his friend's house. We don't want Sarah to go across the street to the neighbor's house. We don't want mom and dad outside by the car. We don't want people wondering where somebody else is because it has happened where somebody don't know and they're not accountable and they will go back in. We don't want that. And if, if, if you're that family member and they're going, your family member is going back in searching for you and you just so happen to be at the neighbor's house and they don't know, that's a heavy weight, that's a heavy burden that carry. So the same thing we teach our little ones, same things we can learn here. Correct? And it, it, it's valuable. It's super valuable. You don't want to wonder, okay? When you get a plan, make sure that everybody understands it. And then when you get outside, what do you do? Do a count. You'll do a count. Absolutely do a count. But what are you able to do inside that I didn't want you to do? What are you able to do outside that I didn't want you to do inside? Exactly. Exactly. Don't stand in the home trying to make figure out, grab your phone and give us a call. No, go outside. Then you can call us. One of the biggest things with emergency and emergency response is when it happens to someone, and we learn this in the fire service and as first responders, everybody's experiences are different. Your reaction to an emergency or an emergency situation is going to be way different from mine. But we want people to understand that keeping trying to keep calm as best you can is going to be one of the factors in life safety. It's one of the major factors in life safety. It's trying to keep calm. You'll be able to move more efficiently and you'll be able to save yourself. Okay. Okay. So I have I mentioned multiple floor dwellings. I'm going to encompass that conversation also with apartments, okay? Because sometimes you got two ways out of a home. It's either the doors or the windows, correct? All right. If you're a multi-family dwelling or if you're an apartment, one of those is going to be hard to get outside of. The other one's going to be a slightly a little dangerous to get outside of, but you can. The doors are going to be tough. The doors are going to be tough. Because you have to go down, and depending on where the emergency is, where the potential fire is, you may not have that option. Okay? So, if everybody could put their hand up for me real quick, put your hand up. So, when you get to a door, if there's a fire on the other side of the door, 
how do we know? You can touch the door. You touch the door to see if it's hot. Keep your hand up. We don't want you to touch the door like this. We want you to touch, exactly, turn your hand around and sweep the back of the door. We do this as firefighters, even with our gloves on, if we're in a dwelling. If I sweep the back of that door, if I sweep that door and it's hot, I'm not going that way. But if it's cool to the touch, I can open it up. You know, understand why we don't want you to use this, correct? Anybody, everybody get it? This is all nerves. This is all nerves, it's very sensitive. So if you burn this, how much function will you get out of it to lift the window or open the door? Burn the back of your hand, you'll still be able to grip. You'll still be able to move things, okay? So we're gonna sweep the back of the door. If we can't go out of that door and there's smoke coming in, what do we do? Try the window, absolutely try the window. That's where you wanna go. So this is where I'm gonna go back to single family dwellings or lower levels because a lot of people still have bars on their windows and bars on the windows are never on the second floor in apartments, correct? They're always on the first floor. So the opposite of what is created in an apartment and in a multifamily, multi-level dwelling happens here where the door might be viable, but now the window is, you can't go out of it. Unless you have a specifically made type of bar that you can open from the inside, which I've rarely ever, ever seen, you're not gonna be able to get out that window. And it's gonna make it hard for us to come in to rescue you. A little bit harder, okay? So you need two ways out. You're gonna to try to get two ways out. One is gonna be a door, one is gonna be a window. Generally, if you got bars on the windows around the dwelling, if it's a bedroom and you have two sets of windows, two bars, on a bar on each set, we're gonna recommend that one of those windows do not have a bar on, at least one of them. I know it's kind of hard when people think about safety, if you feel like that you need bars on all your windows, but what it does is trap you in. And we don't want that. It's gonna be harder for us to get to you. Same thing will apply when we go back to multi-levels and apartment buildings. If you can't get out of your apartment building or you're upstairs and you're trying to get out of a window and say it's third, fourth, fifth floor, what do you do? One of the things we teach um, kids is not to be afraid. Don't hide in the closet. Don't hide under the bed. Don't jump up and go stand in the bathtub and pull the curtain closed. Don't do any of those things. But one of the biggest keys for us when we're responding to a scene is our vision. And when we're responding, we're thinking about all the things that could be going on based off of what was called in. And when we're pulling up, we're actually looking at what could potentially be signs of what's in the house. I think uh, Councilwoman Johnson and I discussed one at a house before when we did uh, a smoke detector and I was talking to her about how we see things as first responders. I could tell from your car. I could tell from what's in the yard. I could tell from probably certain designs of how you have your home. Like, okay, this is a couple with no kids or there may be someone elderly in home, possibly disabled, potentially based off of what the settings are outside. But one big key for us, if we're responding and you can't get out, is to do this. Take a wet towel, put it at the bottom of the door. That's to catch the smoke. Take a window. And if you can't get out of the window, open the window, shirt, towel, sheet, wave something out of the window. If you can't stand there and physically wave it out of the window, place it out of the window. Sit something on it and lock it so that it's there. Once we arrive, we're looking at the whole situation. And if I pull up and I see that there's something out of that window on the back, on the left side, I know immediately, get a ladder, somebody's there. I don't have to go in the front door and check your, your living room, your, the, your first floor bedroom, your back bedroom, then make my way upstairs and check the bathroom. No, something's out that window, somebody's there and we'll come and rescue you. It's just that simple.
Okay? Okay. Um, I really, really want to stay in the house right now. And one of the biggest things that we're going into with this winter season is issues with furnaces and carbon monoxide. All right? Everybody understand some of the dangers with carbon monoxide. If you don't know, carbon monoxide is a danger because it's, it's called the silent killer. You can't see it, you can't smell it, and you can't hear it. But it's naturally occurring. If I had a lighter right now and lit the lighter, just like there's heat coming off of there, carbon monoxide is produced. It's a natural byproduct of combustion. At every fire, there's carbon monoxide present. It's present in your homes for the most part, everyone's home, but at very, very, very minute levels. When it gets higher, the levels get higher, that's when it becomes dangerous to you and your life safety. Older, older individuals and younger individuals are very, very susceptible to carbon monoxide poisoning. And there's nothing you can do about carbon monoxide poisoning except for get fresh air. That is it. Can't take no pill, can't do no jumping jacks. There's nothing, no fruit you can eat <laughs> to subside any of that. All you got to do is get outside, get some fresh air. That's the only thing that'll mitigate the carbon monoxide. And even if you go to the hospital, they're going to pump you full of O2 just to get rid of it, okay? So we're going into the wintertime. When I say our program allots every household two smoke detectors and one carbon monoxide detector, this is what I'm talking about, okay? This is a plug-in. Some of you may have them in home yourselves already. Carbon monoxide detectors almost placed just like, kind of like smoke detectors. When I say don't put it above the stove because it'll go off all the time. Something like that as well. Don't put this near the furnace or near the stove or even near heat vents because of what I just said a minute ago. Carbon monoxide is present at low levels, naturally occurring. So you don't want this going off giving you false positives, okay? Well, we take this, and a lot of people want to put these in the basement because of the furnace. Furnace, water, heater, water heaters, and even some of your um, air ducting, exhausting. Some of it may back up. A lot of people forget about the stove. So, stove is in the kitchen. Furnace is in the basement, correct? If I take this and put it in the basement, and I'm getting carbon monoxide leaking from the, the oven in the kitchen, what good is this doing? It's not, it's not doing much of any good at all, correct? Because what's closer to your bed? What's closer to where you rest? That stove or this? Exactly, exactly. So we recommend you read all manufacturer's recommendations, whatever product you have, but we're going to recommend that you either place it in the living room or the dining room, okay? That will catch everything from the basement up to the kitchen. And when it goes off, you're gonna do the same thing. You're gonna step outside. You're gonna get outside and get some fresh air, okay? A couple of things I want you guys to know about when it comes to carbon monoxide. And this is a big thing for me because our carbon monoxide runs in the past half a dozen years or so has really went up. Has really went up. And trying to figure out what what could be the source? Like what is going on with all these carbon monoxide runs? What's happening? Well, one is more people are learning about carbon monoxide poisoning. So a lot more people are buying carbon monoxide detectors where we didn't 15, 20, 30, 40 years ago. So that's a reason that we're getting more runs. Another reason is we're learning more about the sources. I'll tell you guys a quick little story. Responded to an uh, incident with carbon monoxide leak. Uh, single family dwelling. We had, um, I would say, a couple. And this gentleman, I assume, was showing off his house he had just purchased. This was in early evening. This house had no utilities, nothing working inside. But he was proud of what he had purchased. Young guy, 
probably in his early 20s. But he also had a carbon monoxide detector in the house. So it was going off. We get there, we're befuddled, we're confused. Like, how is there so much carbon monoxide in this house? There's no stove, there's no furnace. It's pretty much a shell. Well, when they were there, what we realized was, without getting too deep in the story, they had eaten, they were having um, like a little dinner, and in that, they also had what I would call makeshift hookahs. I don't know if you've seen these tall things, hookahs. Okay, well, if you're not big into hookahs, they're quite expensive for just a lay person. So some gas stations were selling makeshift, like little red cups that you can make a little hookah out of. No problem with that at all. There's nothing that I know of that's illegal about it. But here's the thing about hookahs. And this is what threw me off, and I had to start adding things up. You're smoking little small flavored charcoal brickets. The smoke off of those. So it's almost equating to those small charcoal grills that you have in the home, that you have at home, that people take outside, do some on the uh on the porch or whatever. That, and because carbon monoxide is a byproduct of combustion, guess what? It went off because it was so high. Same thing with another uh, run we had who, with the gentleman who had a large one. And he had a room in his basement where he was doing work. And he had like a man cave, for lack of a better term, where he was doing the, the work at home. He sat down to chill, to watch the game, smoke a cigar, smoke his hookah. And the same thing happened because he didn't have ventilation. So those are small. That's one example of the dangers of carbon monoxide that we don't pick up on. Anyone have attached garages? If you have an attached garage and you have a charcoal grill, leave that grill out. Same thing happened on another run. We had no idea where this CO was coming from, but come to find out, the homeowner had cooked something on the grill earlier that, that evening. Once it looked cool enough and felt cool enough to take inside the garage, nothing against that. They didn't know that underneath, combustion is still happening. It's still off-gassing. And it built up enough in the attached garage that it leaked into the house. And the numbers were crazy. And one way to mitigate that, you know what we did? We opened the garage door. That's it. Open the garage door, take it outside, let it off-gas, get some fresh air in there. Situation mitigated. We don't have to recommend buying a new stove. We don't have to recommend you getting a, a furnace guy out to try to figure this out. Sometimes it's just those simple things that we miss and we're still learning. That's why having one of these, or multiples of these, is very, very important. Very, very important because we don't know the dangers that do lie and where they come from sometimes. And especially if you're a Detroit resident with a home in the city, I'm saying this again. I want to repeat this again. You get two of these and one of these. No cost to anyone, okay? I have some information here that... Um, Councilwoman Johnson and her team has. If you guys have the access to this, just take a look at it real quick. This is the information pamphlet for Detroit Fire Department. Okay. This breaks down some aspects of each division as it pertains to the fire department. As a community relations division lieutenant, I do not belong to arson. I'm not part of training, EMS or fire marshal. Different aspects of what you will need when it comes to the fire service, you have, with this pamphlet, you have the contact information for. So if you have a question that may be concerning fire marshal division, it's here. If you have a question when it comes to communications, 911 in that aspect, it's here. Fire operations, what happened at a fire or a run that we had, EMS, it's all here, 
Okay. If you don't have access to this, you can go to Detroit city of Detroit website and you can type in fire and you can search that information. I spoke to you guys about getting outside when it comes to fires. We spoke about carbon monoxide and getting outside. When you get outside, the one thing I want you guys, the couple of things I want you guys to remember is be accountable for each other. And at this point, make the call. Correct? Okay. Just so you guys know, just a point of information. If you're not here in this area, but a lot of people don't know that when you dial 911, especially with the cell service now, things are different. Many, many, many moons ago, when I was a kid, there used to be a thing in the kitchen called the house phone. <laughs> and it kind of worked like this. And it worked like this. And it worked like this, right? Okay, we all understood that that went to a switchboard somewhere in the city where they could pull a number from, right? We had large books, larger than this, with people's personal phone numbers and addresses in, correct? Yes, exactly. One for businesses, one for personal. Things have changed. Whereas we used to have the house phone. Well, here's my point. Where we used to have the house phone and there was one number, now, if you, that house, you can have five, six, a dozen people living in there, and guess what? You got one phone number. Now, you can have one to a dozen or more people in there, and guess what? Everybody has a phone number, right? All right. It didn't seem that the switchboard operators all of a sudden expanded. That's not a major business right now, is it? Even though everybody has cell phones, those, those calls go to someone. And a lot of those calls are handled by cell phone companies in rural areas mostly. And this is just a point of information for everyone here. Saying here if in the city of Detroit, if you call 911, it's going to go to 911 downtown. But if you're traveling, and you're out on the road and you're somewhere where you know the gas station is 10, 15 minutes away and you need to call 911, check your service. Check your service because they may be routing you to multiple people to get the 911 that's closest to you. So when I'm going back to remaining calm in an emergency situation, because if you don't know this, you think you call 911, that run has started. Police, fire, EMS, whoever is immediately en route. That may not be true. Whatever information you have may be taken from this person and given to this person who's giving it to the person who's actually closer to you. And then that has to go to police, fire, EMS. OK, so being calm and being succinct and being as direct as you can is vitally important. And if you can't get a chance, call your cell service and see see what they cover and see if that's true for your service. I just want to give you guys that point of information, okay? I have a couple of items. The list that you guys have that the councilwoman prepared has a lot of um, items on there that you would expect. Flashlight, batteries, charger, blanket. We live in Michigan. Blanket. Let me repeat that. We live in Michigan. Blanket. Okay. That is very, very, very important living in Michigan. Um, and some other things like flashlights and contact information. I would suggest that you have something on your person. Your person as far as who to call. Because sometimes in emergencies, I'm saying, please be calm. Some people can't. Some people can't. And if you can't in that moment, take a card out. Call this person. Call my daughter. Call my father. Call my uncle. Please. Here's the number. Just please call them. Because there's been a lot of times when I've spoken to someone in an emergency situ situation, and I'm not a therapist. I'm not your pastor. I'm not your neighbor. I'm not your family. 
So it may be hard for me in aspect to calm you down or know what it takes to calm you down. So if there needs to be calming, give them someone like, I just let them know, hey, I can't wrap my head around right now. Can you call this person for me? Okay. That's one thing. Another thing that I personally have, these are a couple items that I personally like. I got this off Amazon, simple ink pen. I've used this plenty of time on scenes, on scenes, emergency scenes. You're not going to be able to tell because of the lights in here, but it's a flashlight. And I'm saying you're not going to be able to tell because it's lit up now, but if you can dim the lights, you can see how bright it gets. It's not just a reading light for if I'm laying in bed or if I need to write something down. I've used this on the scene searching in my gear and it works great. That's one thing that I have. Another thing that I have that I suggest that people have, I carry this in my car. I carry this in my car because as an EMT, sometimes you just, sometimes situations happen around you, okay? And you wanna be prepared. I've responded to scenes where it's easier for me to use multiple hands, use both my hands, and I got this out of CVS. Blood pressure cuff, electronic. I don't have to palpate or do anything. All I do is hook this up, hit the button, and you can use this in your own lives, in your own homes. If you're feeling away and you think that, hey, um, my blood pressure may be up. Or if somebody is in your home and you think that they may be going through something that gets their blood. I think this was like 20 bucks. It's like $20. And you can get that information right away. This is another one of those things where when you call 911, those point of information. Like, hey, my aunt here, she isn't feeling well. She's such and such years old. And guess what? She has high blood pressure. You're giving all of this information to 911. Well, what is she taking? I don't know, but I can tell you what her blood pressure is. And the medics in route can start adding that up in their head. That way we, once again, just like I said, we're responding with fires, what we're thinking about could potentially be there and what we see coming up, we already know something. If, if dispatch, if central office can give us as much information as possible, that helps mitigate the situation a whole lot quicker. I spoke about smoke detectors. This is one smoke detector that is very, very, very important. Because one aspect of any of these alarms, whether it's your carbon monoxide detector, your smoke detector, your security alarm, whatever, the biggest thing with that and the key with that is you have to be able to hear it. Many in our community, some in our community, are hearing impaired. We want them to be safe too. We want them to be safe too, right? This is a clock smoke alarm. I'm not gonna hook this up because I don't want to demonstrate this thing right here, right now. But when I when I explain to you what's happening, you'll understand why. It's a clock alarm. It works in conjunction with a regular smoke detector. The smoke detector sounds off, it goes off. This hears the smoke detector going off and it responds. It responds by waking, moving the person that is hearing impaired. It's called a bed shaker. This thing really shakes. It hooks up to the smoke, this hooks up to the clock radio underneath the pillow, underneath the mattress, and it moves. Please believe me, it moves. That's probably, that's why I'm not hooking this up right now. Because if I set this off and that smoke detector goes off and it goes beep, 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 and this hears it after one, two, three times, this starts dancing. And it starts dancing for real. Same thing applies. We don't have many of those, but for those that are hearing impaired, that are um, disabled when it comes to hearing, we have those. We have them, and we can get them to you. 
All you have to do is contact us. We went over high rise. We went over escape plans. Went over a few things. I want you guys to think of outside of the home, one other aspect. In the 1950s, during the Cold War, a lot of buildings were made for the threat of nuclear war. So a lot of buildings were made with bomb shelters. I don't believe that construction has kept up with that because of what happened after the Cold War and everything, that threat is leveled down. But here's the thing, some of those buildings still exist. Some of those buildings still exist. And some of those buildings may very well be in your area, in your district. Schools, if they were built around that time, they probably still do. Are they safe now? I don't know. So I'm gonna ask you guys to do me one favor, one more favor, research it. Research it. I'm gonna give you a little bit of homework, okay? And I'll do my homework as well. If there's areas in your area that have bomb shelters or places where people can meet safely, find out about them. Find out about them. I want you guys to know that you also have access to many other aspects of emergencies. You should have the number for EPA. You should have the number for Red Cross available. DOT. DOT. And I'm saying DOT because they transport. There been plenty of times we've had apartment fires and people needed to be moved. If apartment catches on fire and can't just leave people standing outside in the cold, you have access to a lot in this city. From DTE to water and sewage. And everybody can access, you all can access that and you can all ask questions that will help you get whatever your issue or problem is resolved. Okay? Okay, so we're going to review. Home. Smoke and fire. What's the main focus? Get out. That's the main focus. Get out. Get out. Get out. Be accountable for one another because you're all finding one place, right? One place to go. Just like the kids doing fire drills. Just like the kids doing fire drills. I understand you might be cooler with this neighbor than that neighbor, but if the family said that's the neighbor we're going to and that's the porch we're going to stand on, that's where we're going, okay? And then we do what? Call 911. Those three things. I want you guys to really, really, I really want to push that in. I want that to uh, stick with you guys. Get out, be accountable for one another, and call 911, okay? I want to open it up to any questions. If you have questions, I promise you, I'll try to answer them as best I can. Yes, ma'am. Okay. Well, 
I'm not the know of everything, but I'm going to try to answer your question as best I can, okay? Fire hydrants are set off of a couple, uh, couple of criteria. The area, the area that you live in, whether it's residential or commercial, and based off whether it's residential or commercial, they have to be a certain number of feet away from one another, okay? Now, if there is an issue with the hydrant that used to be there, and you're saying it's no longer there, I would say that would be replaced by, that would have to be replaced by the water department. Water department controls the hydrants, and they control what happens with the piping and, and all of that. We as firefighters, we use the hydrants to put out the fires. We also check them every year. You'll see fire trucks around, and we'll check them to make sure that what we have is called, um, how can I put it? We're in, we're in Michigan where things freeze. You've seen this before. Things freeze. And if a hydrant leaks and the water gets out there, you've all seen the ice. That doesn't happen in, in Florida. That doesn't happen in Louisiana. But in order for us to use the hydrant, sometimes that water that's frozen that you guys see out in the street, sometimes you don't see it. We find out on the inside when we're trying to get water to put out a fire. And oh, snap. This hydrant's frozen. It's, it's done. Got to go down to the next one. Oh, this one's frozen too. Got to go down to the next one. Every time we do that, that's doing what? That's taking time. That's taking time. So we go out, Detroit Fire Department, we go out a couple times a year. Once again, we don't control the hydrants. We don't control the hydrants. But for our safety, we check them. You'll see some guys out around this time of year. Yes, we'll be out right now dropping the hydrants, trying to see how much water is above or below the freeze line. If it's below the freeze line, we're good. If it's above, then we have to pump that water out. But if we pump that water out, does that mean that there's not a leak and that water's going to come back? I don't know. We don't know. We'll come back next month and check that one again. Because like you're saying, it's your house, we want you to be safe. If a hydrant needs to be replaced and we see that there's a hydrant miss missing, we absolutely put that down and we mark it. And it goes to the water department saying, hey, at the corner of Morrison McKinney, northeast corner, Morrison McKinney, missing hydrant. Boom, same. We do it right then and there. So if you have one missing, trust me, it's been reported by the fire department. Now, if it's going to be replaced, that's a question for the water department. Anybody else? I would say that that's based off of that's based off of those criteria. That, that's what I'm saying. There's a, I would contact the water department. I would contact the water department because they have to be in a certain number of feet away from one another. We can blow mains. Trust me. We have blown mains. One of the issues in the summertime, like I speak about the hydrants in the wintertime, one of the big issues in the summertime is if we're fighting a fire and we're not getting the pressure we need, it might be because around the corner somebody's got a hydrant open playing in the water or somebody else might have. It's just like your home. You have a water tank. If somebody's taking a shower, uses the bathroom, is in another shower, the pressure drops. And that hurts us when we're fighting a fire. So they have to be a certain number of feet away from each other. That's a question that the water department will have to answer. Mm -hmm. Or what, but why we don't have one um, is still quite a, a question to me why uh, we don't have one uh, and the ivory one and they're all you know very uh, very mm -hmm. uh, they're identifiable uh, I, I, yeah yes nice when we, when we respond to runs can go blocks and blocks and either way from my and we keep block. them all and they're plotted that way for a reason so when we respond the hydrant that's on your street should be on your side of the street. So like I said, if there's a problem with that hydrant, the engine, the pumper can go to the next hydrant. And the next hydrant should be on, yes. It's usually, I don't, don't quote me, it's a number of hundreds of feet apart that they are plotted in the city, okay?
thank thank you for offering that assistance. I was I was going to ask for my staff members to do that as well, um, because we can connect with the water department to address the issue. Yes. Uh, Lieutenant Terrell, I do have yes, a question for you. So I know you talked about getting out of the house if mm -hmm. there's a fire. I also know that it's encouraged for people to have fire extinguishers yes, on is. every level. At what point would you encourage someone to use the fire extinguisher versus getting out of the house? Um, I'll put it to you this way. If the fire extinguisher, like I said, with the smoke detector and carbon monoxide detector, follow the manufacturer's recommendation. I don't like to play with too many fire extinguishers when we speak to people because you can buy the ones that are home and they're simple to use. Absolutely simple to use for small issues, for small issues. But what determines a small issue? You don't know what's behind that wall. And trust me, it could be going behind that wall. So I don't want you to spend too much time trying to put the fire out. That's why the citizens pay us to put the fire out. Now, if it's something simple that you can use a fire extinguisher for, like in the kitchen, some on the pot, put the lid on the pot to cover it up outside. Perfect example, the grill. Let's go back to the grill. The grill's on fire. You close the lid. You take away the oxygen, smother the fire, things like that nature. If you can handle it, take care of it. But if you can't and you're coughing and you're smoky in there, don't, don't, don't play. Please don't. Yes, ma'am. Can you um, tell me the best way um, to handle bomb fires outside? If bomb fires, so mm -hmm. if they need to be covered, and if so, what is it that it needs to be covered with? I'll put it to you like this. In here, I will say, contact the fire marshal and see what the ordinance is, because. What you'd consider a bonfire, we get reports of illegal burning. A lot. A lot. It may be a simple bonfire to you, mm -hmm. but to your neighbors and the people on the other side, they will be called. Well, I know they do in in, in certain places. That's why I was asking because, mm -hmm. yeah, I, I, I haven't heard anything, but somebody does call when... The same neighbor calls all the time when the same way. Uh, all the possibly all the time. And, and fire pits, and they, they sell them. And those that I'm sure they have a certain number of feet that you have to be away from a home. So I would say if you're doing anything with any burning, keep a source of water next to you and, possible, and an extinguisher next to you but follow the ordinance i can't give you what exactly the ordinance is right now it could be 15 feet it could be 50 feet okay. i don't know thank you thank you hello everyone we have a couple questions online the first one is from miss lisa williams how can we get some pamphlets okay uh, miss williams if you want i will leave some with uh councilwoman johnson if you can't get with Councilwoman Johnson and her team, our address, DPSH, Detroit Public Safety Headquarters, is 13013 Ave. That's down. If you guys know where the MGM Casino is, it's just south of there. Michigan and 3rd. Come there. We have plenty of information that we can give out. And if you are a part of a block club, you can come there and get this information as well. I have a lot of it. We have a lot of it there. So Detroit Public Safety Headquarters, 13013. Okay, our next um, comment, great info about fire safety from Cookie Moore. Will this be on Councilmember Johnson's website? This meeting is being recorded and will be sent out during e-blast so people can watch it on their own leisure. Our next um, comment comes from our Chief of Staff, Mr. Gary Gray. Can you please speak about the hazard of doors with double key, key locks? Double key locks. I say good evening, Mr. Gray. I'm surprised I don't see you, my fellow uh, actual Alabamian. <laughs> I'm originally from Birmingham, Alabama. Um, the dangers with that is what we were speaking on before. 
access, being able to get out. When we talk about an escape plan, we're talking about the ease of you getting out. So this is a scenario. Whenever the, the fire department or firefighters talk to you about escape plans, same thing with the kids when it comes to fire drills, we want things to be very, very simple. So at 1.30 in the morning, 12.15 in the afternoon, 4.47 in the morning, can you get up right now and get out? easily that is the focus that is the goal if you have double key locks and you need to unlock yourself what is that costing you a lot of time same thing applies when it comes to those bars on that window the exact same thinking you need to be able to get up and get out there's nothing and i guarantee you there's nothing no product no cell phone, nothing in that house that is more important to us than your life. Okay, the last question that we have in the chat is also from Ms. Williams. Is it good to have a CEO monitor in the garage to monitor build up? Now, that is a good question. Here's my answer as a hazmat tech. It depends on how long you're going to let that car off gas. We have emissions uh, laws, correct? And when I pull into the garage versus a newer vehicle that may burn a little bit cleaner, or if I have an older vehicle, it's going to keep giving off gas. So the same thing I said about the charcoal grill, when I used that example, and I said that they pulled it in to the house, it was cool enough for them to pull in, although underneath it was still some combustion happening and it was still off gassing. The exact same thing happens with your vehicle. There's a reason why you can't open the coolant till a little while after the car has been off. There's a reason why after it's been out for a while, even if though you've been in the house for 15, 20 minutes, that engine is still hot. It's still off gassing. When I say put a carbon monoxide detector in a garage, I'm not going to stop you from putting a carbon monoxide detector wherever you want to put it. I am not. I'm not going to tell you not to put a smoke detector wherever you want to put it. If it makes you feel safe, absolutely. Only thing I would suggest is avoid those false negative alarms because we get complacent. We get complacent. Same thing with putting a smoke detector above the stove. It goes off so much. Oh, my God, it's going off again. It might be going off if you're in the bedroom and you think somebody's in there cooking, but what if nobody's in there cooking and it's going off like for real and you're in the bedroom on Facebook? We want to avoid that. We want to avoid that. Yes, ma'am. I don't have the stats on that because of the windows. That would be hard for me to sell, to, to explain. But I'll tell you this. I might not have the exact percentage, but I'll tell you it's well in the 90s, possibly close to 100, that every fire that I've been to where it's been fatal, if not every fire in the city that's been fatal, the vast majority of people vast majority either don't have these or the ones that they don't they have are inoperable this is very important very very important and that's part of why the commissioner's uh, plan to get us fire safe with these smoke detectors in the next five years we want to be in like 100% but it's going to take a lot it's going to take a lot. It's only a few of us doing this. And, and we got seven, seven, 800,000 people in the city now. We got a lot of work to do. A lot of work to do. So I need you guys' help. I need you guys' help. Any other questions? Any other questions in person or online? Okay. Yes, ma'am. How many keys from the floor you put on the wall or wherever you take it? Um, gotcha. This is one of those things where you got to be very specific to what the manufacturer recommends. Because you will go out and you'll see some 
combinations. Some people have smoke detector carbon monoxide combinations. I personally don't like the combinations. I personally don't like them. But what you have is up to you. We all know smoke detector is gonna go where? Up high. Up high, okay? We keep these a little bit lower. That's part of why it's a plug-in. We rarely have any outlets up top. So you keep this a little bit lower, okay? Reason the thinking is you want to stay at least five, six feet away from a potential source, which is your stove, furnace, or heat register because of, once again, those false positives that I spoke on. And because the majority of the time, the source of carbon monoxide that's given off is going to be low. That's the bottom of your furnace. That's your oven, stove. It's going to be from here down. The danger with smoke is... The danger with fire is the smoke builds up, it goes up, and then come down. So I prefer that it's lower. And I know earlier, when you were talking about the man caves, I know that there is some type of a code or regulation regarding basements. So the man cave is in the basement. So you watch the football game, whatever, whatever. Mm -hmm. You fall off to sleep. Mm -hmm. I know that there is some type of regulation for a certain size windows to go in our basements for an escape. Can you tell us where we can find that information? That would be in this pamphlet. It will be in this pamphlet, and you will contact Fire Marshal Division, and they will give you the regulations on those, on those codes and those ordinances. These are the guys that have that information. Thank you very much. Okay, we have one last question online. Ms. Shiretta Yancey, I'm unmuting you now. Hello, can you hear me? Hello, everybody, and thank you very much for this information. I certainly appreciate everybody who took the time to put this together. It was very inform uh, informative to me. I never knew that you could put the um, smoke detector and the carbon monoxide uh, close to each other. I used to have one um, in my hallway in the ceiling and the other one was not far from, uh, was positioned pretty close to the uh, fire detector. That's really something, it's amazing. I really appreciate this guys, thank you. Well, let me uh, slightly correct you on one thing. I didn't say that you couldn't put them close together, but because so many people make so many smoke detectors and carbon monoxide detectors and so many combinations, I would have to say read the manufacturer's recommendations of placement. Most definitely read those manufacturer's recommendations. What we have that we give, we recommend, we put them low. There's a reason why this is a plug-in, and it is a plug-in with batteries. It comes with batteries as a backup, just in case your power goes out. So these go low. Smoke detectors, we always put those up. We're always putting those up in the ceiling. But if you have something that's a little different, a manufacturer, please read those recommendations. Yes, ma'am. Yes. And we do still have those stickers, what she's speaking of, those stickers that will say a kid is in this room, so on and so forth. A lot of people don't use those anymore for obvious reasons, I guess, safety when it comes to the kids. Yes. Yes, ma'am. All right. Excellent. Can we give Lieutenant Terrell a round of applause? Thank you. Thank you. So one thing I want to be sure everyone is aware of that Lieutenant Terrell mentioned um, is about the bomb shelters. Next month at our November meeting, we are um, planning to have Alert 365 to come and share with us what to do when we hear the sirens. Most people hear the sirens the first Saturday of the month at 1 p.m., but what happens if you were to hear it 
at a different time? Would, would we know what to do? Um, so Alert 365 will be here to talk to us about that. They're also going to share the um, fallout shelter locations with us so that we know where the bomb shelters are, where we would go if there was an emergency. So thank you so much for bringing that up. Um, and, and one of the other things that I wanted to make sure that we talked about was having an emergency kit. Um, so if you had to run out of your home, what is it that needs to be in this kit just in case you cannot get back into your home? Let's say you weren't able to use your vehicle. What do you need to have in this kit that can help you survive? Um, and we have within the information that has been passed out some suggestions on things that you should have. Um, I did attempt to purchase some emergency survival kits. And one thing that I found out is it's hard to buy them in the stores. You really have to purchase them online. But they, they sell them online. It'll include dried foods um, that last for five years. Don't ask me how that works. Uh, <laughs> but you can, you can purchase packets based on the number of people in your household. So you'll have a first aid kit. You may have uh, blankets that are within the kit, um, matches that are in a waterproof container. Uh, some, some of them will have the small stove that you can utilize to prepare food. Um, so just a variety of things just to make sure that if you were stranded, if you were did not have access to your home, things that um, you would be able to utilize in order to survive. But my commitment was to make sure that we raffled off three of them, even though I don't have them here in my possession. I did bring some items that are included within the kit. So everyone that is present has a raffle ticket and everyone online, we have given you a raffle ticket. We put your name in the pail and we are going to pull three names um, and we will make sure that we get these kits to you. Cynthia, yeah. I don't want to look. Okay. Where, where are you? <laughs> I don't want anyone to think uh, this, is, this is staged. Right. So the first, so I can say the person's name because apparently, does this mean that they're not present? Correct. Okay. The name on the back is Orion Watson. So I believe Orion Watson is joining us via Zoom. So Trey, will you make sure you get Orion Watson's information so that we can get the kit to them? Okay. The next person, well, they are. We, it's a hybrid meeting, so it's uh, in person <laughs> and virtually. The next person is also someone who's joining us via Zoom. It is Gloria Scott. Gloria Scott will receive a kit, and the last person is... I dropped well, one on the box, floor. Well, my box was a little... Uh... Another person joining us via Zoom, <laughs> Donna McDuffie. <laughs> so congratulations to the three of them. We will connect with you and make sure that you get your emergency kit. Once again, thank you so much, Lieutenant Terrell, for joining us. We appreciate all of the information that you've shared. Um, and I hope that people will share this information with their neighbors. Um, it is the holiday season. We're moving into that. So I would encourage you to get something that we've talked about today for your family members if they don't have carbon monoxide detectors. Um, I actually have a fire ladder in my house for our second story uh, bedroom. So uh, just keep those things in mind. And now um, if we can go to, Lieutenant Terrell has an event he wants to share. We'll be out doing the fire safety walk next week, uh, Kilmore. Kilborn? Yes, we'll be out putting up smoke detectors and carbon monoxide detectors. On the 26th? A, I believe it's the 26th. Yes. I believe it's the 26th. Yeah. Absolutely. Yeah, absolutely. We'll be on Kilborn. Now, if you want, you can contact you. Most definitely can give me a call, and I'll come out and, and put them up for you. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Yes, so this will be my team and my second um, walk with the fire department.
Thank you. And let me just say this. When I did that, that was one of the most fulfilling things that I have done in this position thus far. Um, and it really was, thank you. It, it really was because we took the fire engine out, Absolutely. the truck, and so it enticed people to come outside. So every single house that we stopped at, we may have had a couple who didn't answer the door, but most people were home. Um, they were very receptive. They were waiting to see what was going on. So that was really exciting. I hope we have the same experience on Kilbourne. Um, we chose, we actually chose Kilbourne because we know we have a lot of seniors in the, the blocks right off of Gratiot near the 9th Precinct. Um, but we will continue to do this work with the fire department. So look forward to seeing us on the doors and, and maybe near you, coming soon. <laughs> thank you, thank you. Okay, so before we uh, wrap up, I just want to give a few updates. So on Zoom, there was some discussion about Shred Day, Shred Day that took place on Saturday. We did have a snafu. Even though we had planned to have Shred Day at the 9th Precinct with the previous captain, um, and we also were working with um, the commander at the 9th Precinct, who is now at the 8th Precinct, they weren't expecting us on Saturday when we arrived. And as a result, the shred truck was put in a lot across the street from the precinct that's on the backside of the precinct. Uh, and so the shred truck was there, it was hidden to people. Um, once I made it on site and there was a resident from Jefferson Chalmers, uh, Ms. Gwendolyn Peoples, who went over to the precinct and said, this truck is supposed to be here in this lot. And um, they then allowed the truck to move into the lot and so it was available probably around 12, 15, 12, 30, and it was there until 2 p.m. Um, we did find out that some people were turned away by the police precinct, by the police officers. And so I just want to apologize for that. We did everything that we knew to do uh, in preparing for the event and unfortunately ran into a snafu. But please know that we will continue to host Shred Day uh, twice a year, one at the 5th Precinct and one at the 9th Precinct. Yes. We will host two. We have two precincts in District 4, and we will make sure that we accommodate all of our residents. Um, that's one thing that I pride myself on, making sure we get throughout the district. Uh, so uh, we just have to make sure we work closer with all of the police officers so everyone knows that we are going to be present any day that we arrive. So Deborah... Uh, Stuart Anderson, I want to apologize to you specifically because I know you were there looking for the truck, um, but we can certainly work out something to make sure that you get your items shredded. Um, just a couple of things that I want to share in regards to things that are being discussed at the council table. So some people have actually asked me about the food grading ordinance. Um, it is an ordinance that Member Benson is sponsoring. Um, we discussed it maybe three or four weeks ago, and essentially the ordinance would provide a sticker on the doors of food establishments. Um, and yes, they do have it in other cities. And um, we had some dialogue about the impact on restaurants, some dialogue about the health department's role and responsibility in all of this, and we asked for member Benson to go back and have some additional dialogue, particularly with the uh, restaurants and restaurant owners in the city. Um, I will say that I had a personal concern in regards to the health department's role in all of this and what they're doing currently, even prior to a sticker being placed on the door, just making sure that we are giving accurate information to residents because today anyone can go on the city's website and see a restaurant's inspection report um, and it tells you if there were violations. Some of the restaurants I think should have been shut down and, and that, that is my personal opinion but if you looked at some of the violations you may feel the same way. Um, and the sticker 
for me, just shows that the health department was there and this was the health department's um, response when they were there. There are, let me just leave that there. Uh, there is going to be a public hearing in regards to the food grading ordinance on October 24th at 10.15 a.m. We will make sure that we share the Zoom link, um, but you can also come down and join us in City Hall um, to be there in person to uh, hear the conversation, to um, ask a question, or you know, to make a public comment around your thoughts and suggestions on the food grading ordinance. I, I did see Ms. Jackson's hand first, yes. gas station, mm -hmm. and they told us that the state that the, the health department was supposed to be um, the restaurant. Correct. And she also told us, like, some of the things and how many, uh, how many inspectors they had, what patrols they go by, certain mm -hmm. patrols and everything like that. And um, she explained um, the zip codes, how they work. And she was willing to work with um, some folks to actually uh, have more dialogue around some of the information. Uh, the young lady from Food Rescue also wanted to do some type of um, presentation to them to show them how that it could work a little different. So I would like to connect you guys with Danielle so that because she's she's been on not the food, not the color ordinance, but she's been trying to get with the inspectors and talk to them and have dialogue around um, different ways of doing. One of the things we um, did call was the hopper food. Mm -hmm. um, shortly, uh, we do have some pictures of some um, meat in there that was bad mm -hmm. prior to the place being blown up. And so when we uh, reached out to the inspector, they had no no record of both of those markets is what we were told. No record. Okay. They, they, they didn't have any record of those two markets. And just today I rode past Hopper. It needs to be, something needs to be done with the site. It's overgrown, it's some dents in it, and it's very bad. It's really bad. So I don't know who we need some help with there. But. Okay. We'll, we'll jot that down and make sure that we uh, reach out to the landowner there. Um, but if you would, please connect us with Danielle. You said, um, I would love to have some conversation with her. We had another question. Uh, yeah, I uh, guess. Now, I was wondering, when they post those stickers, are they going to be small? Because everybody should be able to see them, you know, um, in New York. They're, they're this size, and they go A, B, C, and F, and they're big, mm -hmm. and you can see them. So I'm concerned about them grading, and the stickers will be so small, maybe some people will overlook them. Okay. I'll, I'll make yeah, sure. I'm very I'll concerned that, about that. I'll get that information to Member Benson. I'm not sure that it's been decided the size of the sticker yet. Yeah, but it should be nice and large so everybody can see exactly the inspections and, you know, where they're at. So they can make their own choice if they want to eat there or not. Thank you. All right. Thank you. I saw Ms. Butler's hand and Ms. Perlato. Well, right there, Ms. Durham. Yeah, the things that you've been talking about and that you're going to look into and that are just wonderful. I, it's been a pleasure and an outstanding presentation of ideas and things like the man from the uh, fire department. And I want to bring up something, though, that you and I perhaps have talked in past the about brochure. before. The uh, ordinances. Yes. How about, will, will the con council ever discover or discuss uh, the ordinances that we we do not have now in District 4, uh, that I don't know what happened. They just have died away 
and they've always been there and they're a, a help to the individual blocks in this district of having people uh, do the right thing and helping uh, make it a nice place to live and to put their stuff away, their containers and that and that sort mm -hmm. of thing. And if you're going to ever discuss that again and help uh, when they get those ideas can be put out again, uh, I have just thought about it myself and I've gone to seven different cities where I know people and I asked them all in you know, those cities if they had ordinances in their city that had to be followed by the people in order to make it nice and to have them cooperate with each other. And every one of the seven cities, and I could name them, but I don't want to take up any more time. Uh, they all said, yes, we have that. And we're glad that we have that, uh, those ordinances, and they help a lot. And I think that we're lacking them in this district. I don't know where they went, but they've certainly completely died away. And I think they were a very great help. And to the police department, too, they were a help. So sometime, I hope you'll bring that subject up again. We certainly. With the council or with us. So actually the Building Safety and Engineering Department created a new document with ordinances. The challenge is it's 14 pages long. So we're trying to shrink it down to make sure that we can print it and get it to all residents throughout District 4, but um, citywide as well. Well, yes, I'd like to see that. Okay. Uh, because the ones I'm thinking of are uh, like uh, about eight, eight, eight items long that I thought should be put out to the people. And you're telling me this fortune, uh, that would be, I'd like something. I'd like to see that. Okay. That sounds wonderful. Really wonderful. We, we will make sure that you get a copy of it. All right. Okay. Yes. And I think for ordinance. Yes. Yes, they, they are in effect and we are, we're, we're, we're working with the departments to make sure that they are enforced. Um, so if there's anything in particular that you are seeing in your area, please let us know so that we can work with the appropriate department and have them address it. Okay, thank you. Ms. Butler? Oh, forgot what I wanted to talk about. How many, do you know how many inspectors do we have for the city? That's the main thing we need to know how many we got. Uh, that I'm not sure. I can find out and get back to you. I know they have they have um, inspectors by district, and Donnie Wright is still the uh, inspector over. Or I'm not sure his actual title, but he's over uh, the inspectors in District Four. Okay. In the meantime, we also need to know how many health inspectors that we have for the state of Michigan. Because really, we, I know, I, I definitely know we don't have enough for the state of Michigan. So we are actually really in a very critical sp space for bacteria and going through what we're going through with COVID-19. And as it relates to the brochure, the 14 page brochure, uh, I just like to let everyone know that those brochures uh, were suggested and printed by the Durban administration. And I have been told by several Department of Neighborhood managers and def deputy managers across the city that they're not going to print them for us to have copies. So how can we adhere to the ordinance and the fines that they want to put on us if we don't have the paperwork in our hands. So I just suggest that everyone start calling the mayor's office to find out when, or just ask them to mail a copy of the 14 page brochure to your home. Because if we can put up billboards, we should be able to put those brochures in our homes. And by next spring, Every ordinance that's in my brochure that a resident can get a fine on, we are going to get them. So we should have a copy of those brochures. And it's not on the city council. It's really not on the city council at all. It is the administration. Thank you.
Thank you. Are you asking if there are funds with the mayor's office? Oh. I'm sure they do. Okay, let me, we, we could have that sidebar conversation, but I do want to give another update on um, the property tax appeal and transparency ordinance that is before city council as well. Um, it is the initial response to the overtaxation that has been discussed over some time. Um, the focus is to remove procedural barriers, to increase transparency, and to create oversight. Um, if we have discussed it at the council table, so the ordinance is uh, almost complete and will be draft, drafted, and there will be a public hearing that um, you all can attend, so we'll make sure we get that information out to you as well. Um, and then lastly, just want to share some upcoming events that we have. So tomorrow is the citywide evening council meeting that is being hosted by both council member Waters and council member Young. Um, council member Young is celebrating his 40th birthday uh, tomorrow and it is taking place at the Northwest Activity Center tomorrow at 7 p.m. So for anyone who's interested, please join us. And then on Friday at 3 p.m., member Waters and I are hosting a coffee hours in District 4 at 11040 Whittier, which is right across the street from Megan Evers Baptist Church. Um, so we will be there from 3 until about 4.30. And... That is Friday, Friday at 3 p.m. And I hope that you all are signed up to receive our e-blast and to stay connected with the office. One last thing I'd like to share is I do pride myself on being available and accessible to residents throughout the district. Please know that every decision, every decision that I make, I have to make the decision based on the majority of responses that come to me in my office. Um, I've gotten a lot of feedback about ShotSpotter. Um, and, but the thing about it is I availed myself. We talked about it in September during our virtual meeting. Um, I put out a survey asking for everyone's thoughts. For those individuals who had concerns about it, I worked to address to get those concerns addressed with the police department. One of the things that I heard most of the time was the way ShotSpotter has been utilized in Chicago, but I think a lot of people overlooked how ShotSpotter has been used in the city of Detroit and whether or not the city of Detroit and the Detroit Police Department was um, more militarized in their response as people have said that about the Chicago Police Department. I do know that Shot spotter is the reason that a um, ghost gun manufacturing house was shut down in the ninth precinct. Um, I've also talked to residents or ceasefire members that are on the scene of a lot of shooting incidents throughout the city of Detroit, and they've talked to me about how Shot Spotter has saved lives because residents don't likely call the police when there is gunfire. But that shot spotter heard a gunshot. And when a police officer made it on the scene, found a woman who was pregnant who had been shot in the head. Um, and she survived because the police department made it on the scene. Had they not, she probably would have perished and so would have her, so would have her child. Um, but it was really because no one had called the police. And so when you think about the amount of land that we have in District 4 and how incidents may occur in these areas where there aren't a lot of people, um, that those are really the things that help me to make my decision. Um, but as I stated, overwhelmingly, and I was really surprised at this because what most people don't know is that I was not in support of ShotSpotter initially. And as I received concerns, questions, I went back to the police chief and had conversations around those concerns to make sure that they were addressed. The police chief had sat down and met with some grassroots activists to make sure that um, the police department does not utilize stop and frisk um, when they are investigating scenes. 
they put forth a number of different policies to make sure that our police officers are behaving in a way where they are serving and protecting us and not harassing us. Uh, and so we do know that Chief White needs to hold his police officers accountable and we will hold Chief White accountable. Uh, and so those are the things that reassured me um, in addition to all of you saying, okay, please support ShotSpotter. And, and I will say that I was really surprised by some of the people who expressed support because I thought more people would not support it. Um, but I, I continue, it did pass, I continue to ask District 4 residents to stay engaged with our office. Um, you can email me, you can call me. Most people have my personal cell phone number. Um, you can come to our meetings and share with me. I prefer that you share with me before the vote is taken and not after. But I also ask that everyone understands that I listen to residents throughout the entire district, not just the loudest voices, not just the most adamant people, but I have to support um, the, the entire voice of our community. Okay, hold on. So we with that, go thank you. Hold up, we gotta go online. We got online questions. We have some online questions. Ms. Butler has her hand raised. Oh, yeah. okay. Okay. We yeah, have so we're going to go online. We have um, three hands raised online, so we're going to work through these first. So the first um, hand raised is Deborah Stewart Anderson. Hi there. Can you hear me? Good evening. Yes, we can. Hi, uh, Councilwoman. I wanted to just come on and thank you so much for that explanation. Regarding the mishap on Saturday, I appreciate you for that. And I just wanted to ask about the new resource guide for District 4. Do you think it's possible that we might be able to get a PDF copy of that? Yes, we can certainly That's send it to you. We have your contact information. Yes. Thank you again. Thank you. Okay, the next um, hand raised is Wendelin B. Aldolf. Ms. Adolph, good evening. Thank you so much for all that you do, Councilwoman. I uh, appreciate you very much. I uh, just wanted to um, touch on a, one, a couple of things. One is regarding the shot spotter. And I had at our last meeting when Councilman um, Young was there um, and we were introduced to the new Commander Connor uh, in place of Commander Johnson, I had asked about what was the criteria uh, being that was formed to decide where shot spotter would be placed because I know in my area, it has not been, and I have not yet received an answer on that. So perhaps we can talk, you know, I can talk to someone in your staff about how I can get that information because to date, I have not received a call and it's been 30 days since I shared my information. And secondly, um, I wanted to just also bring up that we've been having a lot of issues with uh, these loose dogs and one of our neighbors in United on United Maiden Block, Jonte Winters, he was almost bit yesterday by a pit bull across the street. We have called several times. I've shared that information with MPO uh, Mitchell. She is aware of it. However, there seems to be a lack of paperwork, uh, a flow uh, from what we've been told uh, in terms of talking to Mr. Winters. He was here at my home yesterday while we were talking about this. And investigator Summerfield from Animal, Animal Control came out. She explained that we are, she is not in our area, but she came out because so many calls had been made by himself. And I actually witnessed him almost getting mauled, and the uh, and so it's it's a it's a long situation. But I just want to bring that up so someone in your area can help me and help John Tay, Mr. Winters, get through this situation. We have children on the block, and they could have been mauled as well. Hmm. 
Thank you for bringing that to our attention. Um, so to answer your first question, I did receive that question. I can reach out to the chief to ask him about ShotSpotter, but I can tell you that it is being expanded to the entire ninth precinct. Um, so your area will be covered, um, but I can certainly get the response from the chief in regards to how they selected um, the locations. Uh, and in regards to Mr. Winters, he was just with us on Friday, so sorry to hear that he was almost mauled, but we will work with um, the director, Lori Soul, with Animal Control, and provide any support that we can in your area to make sure residents have what they need to be able to um, keep their animals um, within, within their property and... Um, there, there is, there, there are several ordinances in regards to it, but we'll, we'll connect with Director Lori Souls in regards to that. All right, thank you so much. Thank you. Okay, uh, we have two more hands raised. The next hand is Mr. John Myers. Good evening, Mr. Myers. Hello, everyone. I, I, can you give us some clarification on the uh, the ordinances? Have they been revisited, or are they still on that uh, site uh, UC code? I'm sorry, Mr. Myers, I couldn't hear you. So <clears throat> um, this is in regards to another caller about the codes. Have have our codes been revisited, or is there like a list of them that's being published, or? Are they still available online? Okay, so Mr. Myers is asking about the codes. Have they been revised or are they on Municode? Like, are they being printed out? He's more so asking about the oh, access, codes. access to, yeah, like the audience. I, I thought he was saying toes. I'm like, <laughs> the toe ordinance? Um, yes. All, well, I was about to say that the ordinance are certainly on Munico, but um, it was shared with me not long ago that the uh, length of time th that it takes before a Municode is actually updated. Uh, so if there is a particular area that you are inquiring about, uh, if you wouldn't mind reaching out to the office, let us know, and we'll make sure you have the updated ordinances um, because although city council may pass an ordinance, it takes time before Municode is actually updated with that information. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, we lost the last call. It was um, Sharon Moore. She wanted to explain the acronym, so we can just share the information from the um, fire department pamphlet with her. Okay, thank you. Uh, and the last question goes to Ms. Brenda Butler. Okay, I didn't see she had her hand raised. Okay, good evening, Councilwoman Johnson. Good evening. My name is Raquel Johnson. Um, I called your office probably about, um, it was the week prior to CBC. So I called because in my area, I live at the corner of Franklin and Copland in the district, and I purchased four lots and privacy fenced them in. Can I stand up, please? I feel more comfortable doing so. Absolutely. <laughs> so I purchased four lots in my area, and I privacy fenced them in. And I keep that area pretty clean. And what I noticed before I put up cameras is that someone was dumping on my property. So in an effort to try to, you know, mitigate that, I put up cameras, I put up signs, I put up lighting because there are no street lights on that corner. Mm. Um, and the one thing I did pick up on my cameras is that there are four family flats that are located on Copland before you get to Warren that have been purchased by owners. I have no clue as to where they are located, but they have real estate agents that I'm assuming act as the, you know, the their mediator to sell their properties. And they are cleaning out their properties and they're placing their trash on my property. So prior to, and I, I saw there was a, a warning shot before everything began to happen with the city. I called um, the Blight Department and I reported it a couple different times um, in June. The inspector came out on 7-Eleven and I was told that they would contact me or I would have some type of interaction with them. 
um, receiving a statement or something to that nature from me in regards to what happened and what I noticed and whatever evidence that I had. I never received a call. The next notification or correspondence that I received was a ticket for $900. Um, I went to court and um, I was the only citizen in court that stated that they didn't dump on their own property who also had video evidence, pictures, and everything, right? So I contacted your office. I also contacted the ombudsman. Um, I spoke to a, cause I'm a member of the CBC. So I spoke to a couple of people that I know and they gave me a little bit of leeway as to where I should go and I'm here. So I decided to come to your meeting and just raise awareness of the blight that's in our area. We have blight to beauty, but how does it benefit the citizens? Mm -hmm. It does not, because here's the thing, I'm being charged for something that someone else has done, whether I have evidence, license plates or, or anything. So why am I being account held accountable, first of all, for land that I purchased from the city, when in a sense, I did them a favor by purchasing it because I'm responsible for keeping it clean. I've invested in my property. I moved back to the city. I stayed in Canton. I came back to the city. I've been here four years. I do a lot of community activism. I'm an engineer by trade, but I do a lot of work for the city as it relates to children, mental health, my, and I just can't for the sake of me figure out why we have come back to the city because of the pride that we have here. I grew up in the city of Detroit. And I have pride in the city. I have three sons I'm raising. I want them to experience the same things that I have. But yet I feel like I don't always have the, the support and the backing of the very people who are stipulated to help us. You know, why are we being charged for something that's being done to us, right? That's one. And then the whole process. How is it that I call the inspector and I make the complaint, yet I'm the one who receives the brunt of that? So, I mean... Being from the streets of Detroit, that's like me snitching. And then I got, I got you know, just seriously. So I'm not, I, why would I report something on my property that right. I did? So there are a lot of different loopholes that have, that are in that whole process, right? So I want to know how does it, how are we benefited as the citizens that really take pride in our properties, mm -hmm. like the woman said, you know, there are ordinance, ordinances that are out there, but when is the last time that they were revised? When is the last time that we all were brought into this room and we were able to not only give our opinions, but our experiences mm -hmm. and, you know, be heard, you know, it's a huge issue. There's blight in lots that mm -hmm. are abandoned, or I don't know, people own some of these lots and they're not held. They're just getting ticket after ticket after ticket. And then me, a homeowner, you know, I, I, I own my home. I own my property. I pay my taxes. I'm up to par with everything. And yet, and still I'm being, right. you know, so I, it's a huge area in our district, and it's like, how do we benefit from it? If you put, if you're putting money into the community, but then I'm getting fined for mm -hmm. something I'm not responsible mm -hmm. for, why aren't we holding other people accountable? Or what can we do? Can we do cleanups? I mean, what can we do? We we can certainly do cleanups. So let me say thank you first and foremost for coming back to the city. Absolutely. Um, thank you, thank you. And let me apologize on behalf of my staff for apparently not reaching out to you and following up with you in regards to your call to our office. Um, my team knows very well that I pride myself on making sure that we respond to our constituents. So um, whomever you re reached out to is here this evening. Oh, my Lord. So, so we will make certain that we um, have a direct conversation with you to make sure we know the area. Um, I jotted down, we're going to reach out to the Department of Public Works, um, or I'm sorry, the Public Lighting Authority in regards to the lights, the street lights that you said don't exist there. Um, we'll talk, I'll reach out personally to the Director of Administrative, I think it's Appeals and Hearings now. Um, to have that conversation because if you have proof of whomever actually dumped the items, I don't understand why you would have received a ticket. Um, so, so let's have a conversation. Um, I'll reach out personally to the director so that we can address your situation. Um, but we are always working throughout the district doing cleanups, whether a resident reaches out to us and asks for support. Um, I task my team with making sure that we do our own cleanups throughout the district. 
um, just areas that we have driven past and we've seen that are blighted, but we have to figure out in this city how to prevent the dumping from happening. Um, and I do know that when, when it's continual dumping that, when there's continual dumping that happens in any particular area, we can have conversations with the Department of Public Works about putting up cameras to um, identify uh, license plates and things of that nature. They don't like to tell us where they are um, because it's really meant to be discreet. Exactly. <laughs> it's meant to be discreet, but we can certainly have those conversations. And we have um, when people reach out to the office and identify areas that continue to be dumped upon. Um, but a lot of people know that blight is, is very near and dear to me. Um, growing up impoverished in the city of Detroit, we didn't have a lot of money, but my mother kept us clean because it doesn't cost a lot of money to be clean. Uh, and, and so I'm really reaching out and appealing to District 4 residents to just make sure their space is clean. And if we all did that, the district would be a much cleaner um, area for all of us. And I think we would feel differently about the way that we live uh, and where we live in, in the district and throughout the city. So it's a huge effort. It is something that I want to make sure that I continue to focus on throughout District 4, but of course I need everybody's help. And, and whatever I can do in my office to provide support to our residents to make sure that we are able to keep the district clean, I'm willing to do it. So thank you so much for coming. We are going to close out now. I did see a couple of hands that were raised. You all know I will still be here, um, but just want to uh, make sure that we don't go over the time. It is 7.56. So thank you all so much for joining us this evening and online. Have a great evening.